forensic scientist examines blood left behind by a criminal at a murder scene. A paleontologist identifies an ancient mummy's relatives. A family receives a paternity test back. A child gazes at a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. Now, do you know what all these scenarios have in common? These aspects of life have all been made possible by a tiny microbe, Thermus aquaticus. Thermus aquaticus revolutionized the process of copying DNA, and along with it, many aspects of science, as well as our society today. Carrie Mullis invented PCR in 1983. PCR is basically the same process all living things use to copy their own DNA in order to grow. However, PCR takes place in a test tube and not in a cell. In PCR, a piece of DNA is heated until it splits. The DNA is then copied by an enzyme known as polymerase. This copying produces two new pieces of DNA. With every repetition of PCR, the amount of DNA doubles, producing over 30 million copies of DNA in just 25 cycles. PCR supplies scientists with enough DNA in order to study it. However, before PCR can be repeated, the mixture must be heated in order to split the DNA. When the mixture is heated, the polymerase dies and must be replaced by opening the test tube before the process can continue. Harry Mullis now explains the hazard of opening the test tube while performing PCR. Opening the tube is not something that, to me, represent anything more than just a pain. You have to be very careful not to contaminate things. Mm -hmm. And the process of opening the tube, there would always be some contamination from other reactions. If you make a billion times as much, mm -hmm. and it just takes one billion mm -hmm. to, to screw it up, you know, one of your hairs is floating around. I mean, that was just a real hazard, was to have to open all those tubes and then go down a line of tubes and stick another microliter of, of of everyone. Little did Kerry Mullis know that his answer was discovered 20 years earlier by Professor Thomas D. Brock. And so I was working in the, uh, uh, in the West Coast, in Seattle area, in Puget Sound. To get there I had to drive out, and so one time we went through Yellowstone. And I got fascinated by all these microorganisms in, in the hot springs, and nobody seemed to know much about them. And so it kind of got started from that. I was looking at hot springs and we could put slides in and then we would, I would just go around and I would uh, I'd tie a little uh, nylon rope to them, drop them down in the spring and then we'd come back a, a week later and pull these out and then take them into the lab and, and uh, look at the, mic on the microscope. This pool here, this is called Mushroom Pool. The Thermos Aquaticus was right here in the outflow, right at this point. That's me standing there. So we took samples of there and we brought them back to the university, which was in those days at Bloomington. The people that were developing the PCR knew they needed a, an enzyme that would work at a high temperature. I got the idea of looking at, at our organisms and so they sent to Washington and got a culture from the culture collection, Thermos Aquaticus. And I thought, uh huh. If I had the DNA polymerase from one of those guys, it would clearly be stable at 100 degrees because the bacteria lives in 100 degrees. Because Thermos Aquaticus lives in boiling water, the enzyme that it uses to replicate its own DNA can also survive high heat. This enzyme, known as TAC polymerase, was extracted from Thermus aquaticus and added to PCR. By using TAC polymerase, scientists don't need to replace the polymerase after every cycle of PCR because TAC polymerase can live at high temperatures. This way, by not having to open the test tubes, contamination is eliminated. The, the TAC polymerase had the wonderful benefit was that you didn't have to do it over and over again. So you just put it all together. Mm -hmm. You need is heat and cool and heat and cool the tube with the top still on it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's going to be so clean. Mm -hmm. And it'll go up exponentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2, 4, 8, 16. I just freaked out. 10 cycles is a thousand. 20 cycles of that's a million. I said, this is going to be incredible. In 1986, three years after PCR made its debut to the world, 
The improved PCR using tag polymerase was published and quickly became the method of choice for researchers. The polymerase chain reaction made possible the work of the Human Genome Project, completed in 2003. It mapped nearly all human genes, helping with the interpretation of human gene functions. PCR allowed scientists to better understand the relationship between a certain gene and a condition that it may exhibit, such as Down syndrome and cystic fibrosis. Genes that often cause the cell to turn cancerous were identified in the Human Genome Project and now can be detected in one's DNA using PCR. Paternity testing has been revolutionized by PCR. In its early stages, paternity testing could rule out only 30% of the male population. However, today PCR can be used to put a finger on the exact father. Another area of application for PCR is in paleontology and archaeology. Before PCR, archaeology was based off material, artifacts, and fossils. However, today these fields have expanded significantly with the introduction of DNA analysis using PCR. Scientists can determine the relationship between ancient civilizations or the difference between DNA of extinct species with those around now. Egyptian mummies can have their lineage remapped, or 5,300-year-old Tyrolean man's DNA can be compared with people now. It is an important tool for linking the past to us living today. PCR has its most famous application in forensic science. A fascinating case I had recently was a homicide in which a victim had been strangled to death. The suspects had taken a pair of shoelaces and wrapped them around her neck, basically choking her to death. When the evidence came into the laboratory, I had the known blood samples from the suspects as well as the victim, and I had the shoelaces. There was no blood on these shoelaces. Again, we were looking strictly for touch DNA. I used PCR analysis, and I was able to generate a profile in which it was a mixture of all three of them, both suspects as well as the victim, and basically it was a slam dunk for the prosecution. Before this process came online, we would have to have very fresh DNA and it'd have to be a very large sample. Now, I can generate a DNA profile using PCR from basically a sample that has been touched. DNA collected from the crime scene can be compared to suspects. The DNA replicated by PCR can create a picture like this one. Every person's picture is different, rather like a barcode. In this case, you can accurately identify suspect 3 as the culprit. This useful identification can solve crimes concerning murder, rape, and kidnappings. DNA fingerprinting with the help of PCR has helped to solve many of history's most famous crimes and conspiracies, including the case of Anna Anderson, who claimed to be the surviving Romanov Grand Duchess, Anastasia of Russia. The real Anastasia was believed to have been killed by Bolsheviks, along with her family and Father Nicholas, all in the same room on July 17, 1918 in Russia. However, there were rumors that Anastasia, the princess, had survived and managed to escape. Looks, language, and scars led thousands to believe that Anderson was a surviving royalty. However, in 2007, when the Romanov family unmarked grave was discovered and the bones were analyzed using DNA, scientists were able to determine that Anna Anderson was in fact not the royal princess. In retrospect, we can see how important PCR has become to the world. I hope you also realize the unsung contribution that Thermos Aquaticus played in this groundbreaking innovation. Thermos Aquaticus truly did revolutionize the process of copying DNA, and along with it, an overwhelming number of fields of science. Thanks, Thermos Aquaticus.